For America, the jet story began the night of October 4th, 1941, with the arrival of a highly secret engine assembly at a Boston airport. It was Britain's now famous Whittle turbojet, the first jet engine successfully produced and flown by the Allies. At that time, England was an embattled island fortress fighting for its life against the full power of the German Luftwaffe. The British aircraft industry, frantically building fighter planes to parry the thrusts of German bombers, had little time for development work. And so, they turned to the United States for help. It was up to America to improve the turbojet and put it on a production line. Gentlemen, I give you a whittle engine. Consult all you wish and arrive at any decision you please. Just as long as you accept a contract to build 15 of them. The Army Air Corps set a six-month deadline for producing the first American jet. Six incredibly short months to plan, design, and build a power plant that was completely new in concept and principle. The project was started with a small nucleus of key personnel. They picked the men they wanted. In most cases, these picked men did not know what they were working on. Of the thousand men on the job, less than a hundred knew what they were making. The planning and assembly of the engine were carried on in different buildings, which were heavily guarded 24 hours a day. The project grew heavily on one of America's greatest resources, industrial know-how. Experience gained in building mighty turbines for battleships and power stations, plus superchargers for aircraft, provided a springboard from which this work went forward. Test and experiment provided new information about the combustion of fuels under a wide range of conditions. Research produced the special metal alloys needed to withstand the heat of the combustion chamber. The workers seemed to sense the true value of what they were doing. They were teammates. There was a wonderful spirit of common purpose, of cooperation among the British, the Air Corps, and the men of industry. In this atmosphere, as these historic films show, the engine grew at an unbelievable rate, and before long, it was apparent that it would bear only a basic resemblance to the Whittle engine. At last, the first U.S.-built engine rolled under heavy guard into the test cell right on schedule. Now the men who built it would see the results of six months of around-the-clock effort they would see the birth of the jet engine in America. The first really radical change in our air power since the Wright brothers' flight. That is, they would see these things if the engine worked. American skill and ingenuity had transformed the turbojet from a handmade model to a practical aircraft engine capable of being produced in quantity on an assembly line. American aviation was on the threshold of a new era. Men who have aspired to flight have always been concerned with two fundamental factors, the aircraft and its method of propulsion. Sometimes the craft itself has uh, been unsatisfactory. Sometimes the method of propulsion has lacked power, or perhaps too little thought was given to power control. Now here, the means of propulsion was quite simple. While in this, it is so complicated that it borders on, uh, well, confusion. The engine-driven propeller has long been the principal method of aircraft propulsion. Its action might be compared to that of a huge screw that bores its way through the air and pulls or pushes the plane along. But certain inherent characteristics of the propeller have always presented serious difficulties. At extremely high altitudes, the air is so thin that the propeller cannot get an efficient grip upon it. So, at extremely high speeds or high altitudes, and especially at both, its efficiency declines rapidly. The tips of the propeller will attain the speed of sound before the rest of the plane, resulting in shock waves and forcing a limit to the speed of propeller-driven craft. Now, in jet propulsion, or propulsion by reaction, there is no propeller to limit speed or altitude. Hence, men have sought for years to utilize 
the propulsion by reaction principle in flight. This principle of propulsion is very simple. Newton's third law states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The lawn sprinkler turns because of the weight and speed of the ejected water. The fact that the water is ejected in air has nothing to do with the motion. The sprinkler would still turn in a vacuum. The rocket travels because of its reaction to the weight and velocity of the matter it ejects. However, with present day fuels, the rocket's limit of flight is fairly short. The jet plane operates on the same principle. It moves forward because of the reaction of the jet. At present, only the jet engine makes possible sustained flight by reaction. The turbojet engine consists of two main rotating elements. The compressor and turbine are mounted on a single shaft. Air is drawn in, compressed, and packed into the firing chambers where fuel is injected. The constantly burning fuel tremendously increases the energy of the enclosed gases, which rush out of the tail cone at about 1,200 miles per hour and give the plane its forward thrust. This is the simple principle of reaction propulsion that changed the whole outlook of the aviation industry. These are the original films of the Bell Air Comet, making the first jet flight in America in 1942. The general electric engine which powered that flight is now in the Smithsonian Institute. It delivered 1,300 pounds of thrust. Then came the I-16 with 1,600 pounds. And when 4,000 pounds were delivered by the J-33, the jet engine really came into its own. This was the engine which powered the Lockheed Shooting Star, our first operational jet fighter. Improvements in engine and plane design followed rapidly. The Republic Thunder Jet, the Douglas Sky Street, holder for a time of the world speed record. The Navy's first operational jet fighter, the McDonnell Phantom. And Northrop's flying wing, powered by eight jet engines. Today, American turbojet engines are powering the great new planes that were designed for them, such as the high-speed, high-altitude interceptor, Republic XF-91, the North American F-86B, the Martin XB-51, North American's B-45, our first operational jet bomber. The Boeing B-47, super fast long range bomber. And the mighty Convair B-36B, the intercontinental bomber powered by six piston engines and four jets. Tomorrow, who knows what continuing research will bring. Jet airliners that will span our continent faster than the sun. Even the atom may release its fantastic store of energy in a power plant for aircraft. But whatever is to come, we can be sure that America's industrial skill will retain its leadership in aviation. And that the planes of today, as well as the planes of the future, will continue to maintain, as they have always maintained, the common security of free people everywhere.